Good morning. And happy Father's Day to all you fathers, stepfathers, men. We, uh, we hope you have a, a blessed day today as you spend time with, uh, with your families. Now, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to the Gospel according to Mark. The Gospel according to Mark. Uh, this morning we're going to be in uh, Mark chapter 1, if you can grab a uh, Bible and, and turn there. Uh, last week we uh, started this sermon series on the Gospel according to Mark, where we are looking at this picture of Jesus as the uh, suffering Savior and conquering King. And uh, we have a nice little picture here to kind of keep that in our minds. Uh, over the next little while, we'll be breaking this book down passage by passage, gaining this rich picture of Jesus as the authoritative yet suffering Son of God. Uh, my hope for us as a church is that this study in Mark will help us to, to know Jesus better, uh, that we would know Jesus better. And I'm not talking about simply, you know, knowing about Jesus and all these things that uh, Jesus said and did. We're, we're not reading through Mark going, look, Jesus healed another blind guy. Uh, no, we're, we're reading through Mark to see what Jesus healing this blind guy tells him about himself and how we relate to him as he is our Savior and King. So that's the, the thrust behind this series. Last week, uh, we looked at how Mark opened his gospel with the words, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and how this, this statement is a defining line in Christianity. Uh, what we re realized from the outset is that this Jesus is not only the promised Messiah who would come to save God's people from their enemies, but this Jesus is, is deity. He's very God of very God. Uh, this then requires us to make a decision. You know, do we believe that Jesus is the good news or are we still you know, holding out for something or someone greater? This is not something we can take, simply take a, a back seat on. We, we will either believe it or we won't. And so uh, as we dive into our text for this morning, we, we need to keep this statement, this claim about Jesus at the forefront of our thinking. Who do we believe Jesus to be. Uh, this morning we're going to take a look at the baptism and temptation of Jesus. This is kind of the next uh, passage that we're going to look at. Uh, and this is interesting. This is an interesting passage for me to preach on because uh, for the longest time I didn't like uh, the idea of baptism. I, I wanted um, to, to be baptized when I was like eight or nine years old, but my parents didn't think I was ready. Uh, so I, I just wasn't I just wasn't baptized. Uh, later on in my life, my, my parents uh, started asking me if, if I wanted to get baptized. And at the, that point, you know, I wasn't interested anymore. And I didn't see the point of it because it wasn't, you know, necessary for uh, salvation and that kind of thing. So I, I fought my parents hard on this for years. Uh, and I had all the arguments down and, and no one was able to convince me uh, out of uh, my, my arguments that I, I needed to be uh, baptized as a follower of Jesus. Uh, but then I went to Bible college and I realized that I knew very little. And uh, it was actually at Bible college that I was convicted of my, my need uh, to be baptized. And so uh, the following summer, I, I was baptized by my dad in front of uh, the church upon profession of my faith in Jesus. And it was, you know, one of the more uh, humbling moments in my life as God had clearly uh, done a work in my heart. And, uh, and now I have the privilege of, of preaching on the baptism and temptation of Jesus. And so since this is uh, Father's Day, uh, we're going to look at how Jesus pleased his father uh, by what he did and by what he did not do and, and what this means for us today. So we're going to look at uh, how Jesus pleased his father by what he did and did not do and what this means for us today. That's going to be our, our roadmap for our time together this morning. And so just so we can clearly see that these are not my words, but that this is the uh, word of God, uh, let's read Mark chapter 1, 
uh, verses 9 to 13. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Uh, I said uh, last week that Mark is a very fast-moving book. Um, Mark kind of goes from one thing to uh, the next rather quickly, giving us this basic narrative of the, uh, the life and ministry of Jesus. And, and we see that Mark dives right in. In those days, uh, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Uh, Mark doesn't tell us the birth story of Jesus like Luke does. Uh, but what Mark does tell us is that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. And if you're wondering what that has to do with anything, then you're responding like how the original readers would have very likely responded. Uh, you see, the people of Jesus' day, they were all expecting the Messiah uh, to come in splendor and majesty. And Mark saying that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee wouldn't have been very glamorous or eye-catching. Uh, maybe if Jesus was born in a palace, or maybe if he had the appearance of power, uh, then maybe they would have believed it. But to come from essentially nowheresville in rustic Galilee, that doesn't sound very appealing. Uh, in fact, in, in John chapter 1, this is you know really interesting. Uh, John chapter 1, is, as John is giving his account of Jesus calling uh, the first disciples, Philip, one of the disciples, uh, goes and finds Nathaniel. And he says to him in verse 45, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Uh, and you have to love Nathaniel's response because he's just like us, right? Uh, he says to Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Right? It's, it's not what I expect out of the Messiah, the, the promised one of God. So can it actually be true? And Philip says to him, come and see. Come and see. And this is exactly what Mark is, is drawing us to do as well. Mark is inviting us to come and see this Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Because really of what happens next, and that is Jesus comes to be baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, if you remember from last week, uh, John is this uh, strange character uh, out in the wilderness. He's wearing camel's hair and he's eating locusts. He's, he's calling people to repent of their sin. I mean, he really isn't holding anything back. It's, it's not like he's trying to be uh, sensitive to where, where people are at. John is, is saying as boldly and as simply as he can uh, that the people are sinners and that they need to repent of their sin. And uh, we think, well, it's probably not, not great PR work, not necessarily an, an excellent salesperson, but it works, right? P people were coming out in droves, it says, from all... Judea and Jerusalem, uh, confessing their sins and receiving this, this baptism of repentance. It, it's reported that a few hundred thousand people uh, were baptized by John during this time. That's a lot of, lot of people. But, uh, but here, Jesus has come to be baptized by John. And we're all wondering, you know, what he's, what he's doing here. Because John's baptism was a baptism of repentance and, and Jesus obviously had nothing to repent of. He had no sins to confess. In fact, he is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Uh, in, in Matthew's account, John actually tries to uh, prevent Jesus from being baptized, saying, uh, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus, Jesus says to John, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And I mean, we're, we're talking about the truly righteous one, right? What is Jesus doing coming to be baptized? Look at the next two verses. 
It says, and when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and, and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. And so Jesus did not, did not need a baptism of repentance. It's not like Jesus had anything to repent of and no, no sin that he needed to, to, that he needed to uh, confess. Instead, by being baptized, Jesus is identifying himself with the lowly sinners he came to save. Jesus humbly stepped down into the waters of baptism and showed himself to be the perfectly obedient son of God, even though he had done nothing wrong himself. And Mark writes that there are three things that happened when Jesus came up into the water that kind of confirmed this for us. First, uh, the heavens were torn open. The heavens were torn open. Uh, this imagery would have brought the minds of the original readers uh, likely back to uh, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 1, which says, uh, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. Uh, the tearing open of the heavens signified that there was now uh, nothing between uh, God and man. There, there was nothing separating God and man. It meant that God uh, was going to make his presence known among his people. He's going to do that in some way, some form, some fashion. And the other, the, the other place that, that Mark uses this word uh, that kind of... Um, clarifies this for us is that the crucifixion of Jesus uh, when the temple curtain is is torn in two from top to bottom. But notice that Mark uses uh, this word in both of these instances surrounding the person of Jesus, uh, person of Jesus Christ. He uses that his baptism and his crucifixion. And what this means is that God is going to do something among his people and it's going to happen through Jesus the Son of God. As the, the heavens are torn open, then the people are waiting to hear what God is going to say and do, likely through this Jesus. And this leads to the second thing that happens, and that is the Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. Uh, later on, when, when Jesus gets, to, uh, gets back to Nazareth, his ho hometown, uh, he reads a portion from Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, which says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And it says that when Jesus sits down, the eyes of everyone are on him. And he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And so what Mark is drawing our attention to here is how the Spirit has come down upon Jesus to enable him and to strengthen him to fulfill the office of mediator between God and man. Right? With, with the, the heavens and the temple curtain yeah, torn open, Jesus is now the one who stands in the gap between God and man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says that, says that there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. The, the Holy Spirit has come upon Jesus to do really what only God can do. And this brings us to the third thing that happens when Jesus comes up out of the water, and that is the declaration from God the Father in heaven. The declaration from God the Father in heaven. Look at verse 11. It says that a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So you can see this, this beautiful uh, Trinitarian exchange as, as God the Father speaks from heaven and God the, the Holy Spirit descends upon God the Son. The, the three persons of the Trinity are, are all involved in, in this unmistakable declaration of Jesus as the Son of God. They're all coming together for this beautiful purpose. So, I mean, th those who say that Jesus was just a prophet, you know, a guy who, who lived a good life and said some good things we should live by, I mean, they've, they've clearly missed out on who Jesus is. Jesus was no mere prophet. 
Uh, one commentator writes, to no prophet had words been spoken such as the words to Jesus at the baptism. Abraham was a friend of God. Moses, a servant of God. Aaron, a chosen one of God. David, a man after God's own heart. And Paul, an apostle of the gospel of God. This declaration enables Jesus not only to speak and act for God, but as God. He is the beloved son. And so as, as we, we go through this book, we are going to see that this is how Jesus is able to do the crazy things that he does and even say the crazy things that he says. Like, I mean, he, he's forgiving sins. He's calling tax collectors to discipleship. He's healing the sick. He's casting out demons and he's challenging the, the Jewish religious system. All of it, Jesus is able to do because he is the son of God. The reason why Jesus was baptized was so that he could be the perfectly obedient son of God. He, he, didn't, he didn't need baptism, but he submitted himself to it anyway so we could see that our Savior has been there and he's met us in our weaknesses and he's come out victorious. He has accomplished all that we could not. So that's what Jesus does that's pleasing God to his father. But let's look at what Jesus didn't do that was pleasing to his father. Look at verses 12 to 13. It says, The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Uh, after I was <clears throat> baptized, I went through uh, some of the hardest trials that I uh, faced in my life. Uh, it's like identifying with Christ through baptism. Uh, it kind of puts a target on your back so that the devil knows who, uh, who he needs to target or, or something. Uh, but it was right after I was baptized that I uh, headed back to uh, Bible college for my second year of biblical studies. I was uh, part of student leadership, so I needed to be there a few days uh, before the rest of the, the students arrived um, in order to, to get some things ready. And I just remember this, you know, this dark presence hanging over uh, the college when I arrived on campus. And uh, in that first week uh, was a really hard week for me. Uh, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. Uh, I was having panic attacks. I was struggling with depression, anxiety. Uh, I was convinced that Helena was going to uh, break up with me. I, I was a nervous wreck. I couldn't, couldn't handle it. Until finally, uh, the peace of God which transcends all understanding came to me and, uh, and I, I had peace for the first time in what felt like a long time. And I can look back now and I can see how, how God brought me through, but at the time, I wasn't sure, you know, really what to, to make of it. But then, um, you know, I, I read what it says here in Mark. No, notice who it is who drives Jesus into the wilderness. Who is it who drives Jesus into the wilderness? It says the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And so just so we can get the full picture here. Uh, Jesus comes up out of the water. The heavens are torn open. The Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove, and the Father speaks the words, you are my beloved Son. With you I'm well pleased. And, and then the Spirit drives, uh, immediately drives Jesus out into the wilderness where he would be tempted by Satan for 40 days. I mean, there seems to be some, like, miscommunication here. I thought the Father was, was pleased with the Son, and yet... It, it seems like the father is willing to send the son into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. So, I mean, what's, what's going on here? And what we do, need to do is we need to notice where Jesus is being driven to. Where is he being driven to? He's being driven to the wilderness. Uh, last week, we saw how the wilderness is a picture of deliverance, how God meets his people in the wilderness and he draws them to himself. And, and we're going to see that here, but we also need to see the wilderness as a, as a picture of fallen creation. It's a picture of fallen creation. Uh, at the end of Genesis chapter 3, uh, God punishes the man and the woman for their, 
the, the, their sin uh, by casting them out of the Garden of Eden. The, the place where uh, there was this constant communion with God. Uh, verse 24 says that God drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that uh, turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. There was now no more access to the garden and really no more access to God. The, the man and the woman were driven out into uh, the wilderness, the, the chaos of fallen creation. So to follow this, when Jesus gets driven away from the Jordan River uh, after he's uh, declared that, that he is the Son of God, he isn't driven out into the garden. He's driven out into the wilderness. He's driven out into the wilderness. Jesus came to a fallen world in order that he would redeem this fallen world. I mean, we, we, we look around at the disease and the wars and the pain and the death, and we are keenly aware that we live in a fallen world. But this is where Jesus came to bring redemption in order to restore what Adam lost. Jesus had to win the battle in the wilderness. Now again, Mark, Mark doesn't include the details of the temptation of Jesus like Matthew and Luke do. We, we don't read here about what Jesus said in response to the temptations of food and power and authority. Instead, Mark simply says that Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days and he was being tempted by Satan during that time. 40 days is a long time to be tempted by Satan. I mean, I, I feel like Satan doesn't have to to do much to bring us down. Our, our sin nature often creeps into our lives and rears its ugly head, but not Jesus. There, there was nothing that Satan could do to trip Jesus up. Jesus didn't have uh, a sin nature. He wasn't fallen like you and me. The, the, the good news that we read here is that Jesus did not give in to the temptations of Satan. He, he didn't give Satan a square inch. But then notice that the father did not abandon the son in the wilderness. That's, that's hopeful too. He, he didn't leave him there. It says that Jesus was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Now, this isn't the only time that the angels ministered to Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, verses 43 and 44, as Jesus is praying, praying in Gethsemane uh, before he would be uh, taken away to be falsely tried and crucified, it says, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. Why was that angel strengthening him? Because it says, in being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like dr great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So, I mean, you, you want to you know how much agony Jesus went through to secure your salvation? This right here. This, this is intense agony for your soul. Okay? Uh, up until Jesus' crucifixion, we see Satan going after him, trying to tempt him to abandon his role as the mediator between God and man. But Jesus doesn't give in. He doesn't because once again, he is shown to be the perfectly obedient son of God. Jesus pleased the father by not giving in to the temptations of Satan. And what this means for us, what this means for you and me, is that the same father who did not abandon his only son in the wilderness will not abandon us, his children, if we are his children. How comforting is this for us as followers of Jesus, right? In Romans chapter 8, verses 7 to 8, the apostle Paul gives us a picture of the natural state of man. He says that the mind that is set on the, the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is, this is where everyone initially finds themselves. We are hostile to the things of God. We, we do not naturally submit to God and his law. Every part of us is incapable of pleasing God. 
But then Hebrews 11 verse 6 gives us the remedy. The author writes that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And I mean, again, we're, we're confronted with our natural state that without faith, it is impossible to please God. But the question that we rightly ask is faith in whom? And the answer that we see here in Mark is faith in Jesus. It's faith in Jesus. The, the declaration from heaven is that the Father is pleased with the Son. So, so as followers of Jesus, we can look back to when we were saved by grace through faith. And we can rejoice that, that though it was impossible for us to please God, there was one who did please him, and his name is Jesus. This Jesus, who is completely innocent himself, would eventually go to the cross to pay for the sins of the guilty. The righteous would die for the unrighteous, thus fulfilling the role as mediator between God and man. And what this does is it essentially frees us up to stop trying to earn what we could never earn. I mean, if we are going to church or, or giving away our money or volunteering our time or not smoking or chewing or dating girls who do, if we are doing all of these things to try and please God, it's not going to work. In fact, it will only exhaust us because we are trying to earn what is already being earned for us. What this does is it, it, it simply exposes works-based righteousness for the fraud that it is. It, it won't ever get you what you want in the end. Instead, it will only leave you tired and angry with God because you've missed who Jesus is. I, I, I remember uh, asking Jesus into uh, my life at the age of four. I was right after our church's uh, Thanksgiving service and uh, I just felt like it was something that, that I needed to do. So I asked my parents to help me become a Christian, and they joyfully did. Uh, but as I grew up, there, there was always this creeping uncertainty that I hadn't done it right. And so whenever my, my dad would conclude his Sunday morning sermons by putting a, a version of the uh, sinner's prayer on the PowerPoint, I would uh, pray that prayer because I wanted to make sure that I was, an, a, that I was a, a Christian. And I did this all throughout my teenage years. Whenever my uh, dad or, or any preacher said to, you know, pray this prayer, I, I would do it. And I never had this assurance of salvation because I wanted to, to make sure that, that what I did was enough. Essentially that, that I was enough. And instead, listen to these words from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. It says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. According to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious gr grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The King James Version says that he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Do you, do you know where acceptance is found? It's found in Jesus, who is the pleasing Son of God. It's not found in your efforts or in my efforts. It's found in the person of Jesus Christ. That's our, our faith in this Jesus is where this is found. We, we are not enough, and that's the point, Jesus is enough. And what Jesus did was enough. What we need to realize this morning, if we have not realized this already, is that our faith in the pleasing Son of God means that we are well-pleasing in the sight of our Heavenly Father. But when I have declared that Jesus is Lord, and I believe that what he did on my behalf was enough for me that when the father looks at me, he doesn't see my weaknesses and shortcomings. He sees his pleasing son. And I mean, I know exactly where I fall short. But when he looks at me, he sees the pleasing son. And that's hopeful. 
That's, that's comforting for us. And if, if you're here this morning and you're struggling with assurance of God's salvation of you, I hope you will take a step back and see the glory of God's acceptance of you in and through Jesus because that's where true life is found. And as we think about Father's Day and, and trying to find acceptance in our earthly fathers and maybe we're not getting that, guess where? acceptance can be found. It's found in our Heavenly Father. If you're here this morning and you've never made that commitment, I pray that you will make that commitment today. If Jesus is not Lord of your life or if you're still trying to earn what you can never earn, there is freedom, true freedom found in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He will give you the peace that your heart longs for and the assurance that you crave if you submit yourself to him today. This, this is where God wants to meet you, but it's not where God wants to leave you. And this is why our aim as we go through Mark is to know Jesus better. When we submit ourselves to the sovereign rule and reign of King Jesus, then we will know Jesus on a, a level of greater intimacy than ever before. And we will go where he wants us to go and we will do what he wants us to do and we will say what he wants us to say. Now, how does that, how do we apply this to our lives? I think there's two ways. Number one, I think we, we pursue baptism. We, we pursue baptism, not because the act itself is saving us or that it's washing away our sins, but because our Savior and King was baptized. That though he, he did not need it himself, he submitted himself to it as the perfectly obedient Son of God. So for us to desire baptism is to desire to follow Jesus where Jesus goes. And I've actually been, been approached by someone who is interested in baptism for the fall. So this is where God is, is leading you. If you want to identify with Jesus in his baptism, then I encourage you to come talk to me and we will walk through what that will look like. And then secondly, I think we, we embrace the wilderness. We embrace the wilderness. Uh, after Jesus was baptized, where does our text say that the Spirit led him? And led him to the wilderness. And if we have submitted ourselves to King Jesus and, are, and we're, we're following Jesus, where Jesus goes, right? Then where should we expect to go? We should expect to go to the wilderness. Right? And our, our worldly inclination is to say that our God, if he is, if he is truly a good father, would not send us his children where we will encounter temptations by Satan and agony over what is to come and persecution from those who oppose Jesus and ultimately leading us to the cross that we are called to bear. If he's truly a good father, that, that's going to be our, our worldly response. And there's actually a push to change the Lord's prayer from lead us not into temptation to do not uh, do not let us fall into temptation or something along those lines. Because we can't imagine a God who would lead us close to temptation. But then we read the words from 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. So if, if we're following Jesus, it should give us great hope that the power of God is at work even in the wilderness. That through the, the perfect obedience of the Son of God, we can know that our Heavenly Father will not abandon us in our wilderness. That's the hope. That's the hope for us as we take uh, our, our step of 
obedience and following Jesus where he goes. And so my prayer for us is that we will have eyes to see and ears to hear the, the, the glorious truth about this Jesus in his, in his baptism and in his temptation. Will, will we follow where he leads us? That's, that's the question that we are left with. Will we follow him where he leads us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these are such uh, mighty and glorious words. We can scarcely take them in. But we, we thank you. We, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your gospel. Uh, we thank you that you did not abandon your son in the wilderness and that you will not abandon us. You will not leave us or forsake us. You, you've given us a way of escape in all trials and temptations. We, we can count on that. We, we thank you for your acceptance of us through your well-pleasing son. You are truly good and truly great. And so God, we pray that we, we might love you, Lord, more and more, and that we might love your word more and more in the rich blessing that it is for each one of us here today. And God, we pray, we pray that you would send us out in the power of your Holy Spirit to do what you would have us do and to say what you would have us say. God, go with each person here. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.